Hey, Angela, are you there? Yes, Erin, I'm here. Oh, so good to hear your voice. Yeah, good to hear your voice too. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Good. Where are you, Colorado? Yes. Yeah, in Fort Collins. We've ah, Fort all Collins, been working right. for, from our homes for 10 weeks now. Oh, okay. Yeah, with uh, Ryan. Yeah, I'm here as well, uh, Angela. Good to hear from you. Nice to hear your voice, Ryan. How are you? Doing well, doing well. You know, every day, every day is a different day, but uh, we're we're all figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, we are all learning as time comes and uh, evolving and changing ways of doing things. Exactly. Yeah, but uh, that's okay. There's always. If you think, if you get your head structured in the right way, there's always some small positive you can find in any challenging situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are always opportunities that we can always ride on in everything. That's, we that's... just have to look for them. Yeah. So, unfortunately for me, I have another webinar starting at the same time. Mm, okay. So, I don't know how I'm going to juggle around this. Yeah. I actually mm. have three. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, wow. so I just said let me let me log in and see say hi. So if you see me disappear, it's because of that. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, we're gonna wait until about uh, another five minutes and see who all is able to join. We think just a few people are able to join, and then we'll get started and we'll incorporate you as soon as we see you. Okay. Okay. So this is just for our class, right? This is just a this check just conversation, exactly. It's just going to be the group that came in 2018 to the tourism seminar. And this is just uh -huh. a, literally just a check in. How's everybody doing? How are each of the countries okay. responding to the situation? What's the prospects for tourism and mm -hmm. in, in the protected areas recovering after COVID? So it's not like a, just like a listen webinar, okay. but more just us trying to hear from people and provide a space to check in and, and, and see how people are doing. I see. Okay. We will do other webinars later into June where we'll be more specifically focused in on, uh, you know, presentations uh, from, from mm -hmm. panelists and that kind of thing. This is more just uh, mm -hmm. an engagement web webinar. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Okay. Cool. Oh, it looks like I'm very early, right? This is, this is before... Yeah, before we have... time, actually. Minutes exactly. before, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. We're still just waiting for people to join <laughs> okay. in, so... Yeah, no worries. We'll, uh, we'll see you when you join back. Okay. All right. I, I just heard from Veronica. She's trying to connect. Okay, great. Okay. Welcome, Elena. Hi, Erin. Hello, everybody. Good to hear your voice. How are you? Uh, fine. Okay, and you? Doing well. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Erin. How are you? Doing all right. Doing well. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks. <laughs> You're the same as everyone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> We are trying to plan everything to reopen the, the park for the locals and for the tourism. And then in Galapagos is, uh, is a big, big economy crisis. Yeah, yeah, I imagine. But anyway, <laughs> we are doing our job. So right. let's see. And everyone's happens. healthy. For the most yeah, part. how are you? I'm I'm 
doing well with ups and downs, but overall very, you know, very grateful for the situation I'm in, employed, have a good place to live. And um, Fort Collins, it's really beautiful right now. It's warm and green and there's plenty to explore. So that's nice. What a beautiful picture. I don't have it. <laughs> so nice memories. Yeah. Yeah, shared. I'm actually missing everybody. Oh, that was, yeah, that was okay. such a great memory. Okay. Well, I'm glad finally was able to, to, to uh, connect. For one seminar, it's been big days, a lot of uh, work. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad to hear you. I'm so glad to hear you. <laughs> we could hey, do a Veronica. quick virtual hug. <laughs> Good to hear from you, Veronica and Elena. This is Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Hey, guys. Hi. Glad you were able to join us. We're going to give it just a few more minutes and try to allow time for anybody else that wants to join or is able to join. We know a lot of people uh, didn't have uh, uh, the ability to connect with their uh, internet connection or the timing didn't work out or something like that. So we'll just give it some more a little more time for people to be able to join before we, uh, we dive in. But it's largely just going to be a check-in webinar where we just want to provide a space for all of us to be able to update each other on how everybody's doing, provide the moral support and, and just hear from everybody and, and see, see, how, see how things are going. Morning, Jim. Good morning, Aaron. Morning, Jim. We're uh, we're on with Veronica, Elena, uh, Angela is kind of going back and forth between a number of webinars, but she is connected. And uh, we were just going to give it just a few more minutes to allow uh, a little bit more time for anybody else that may be, may be joining us a few minutes late. And then we'll, then we'll jump in here in just a, in just a minute or so. Wonderful. Well, um, I think we'll go ahead and get started just to respect the time. And I know everybody has a lot of things going on and, and it's difficult to find uh, an hour here or an hour there with uh, all the different time that we're spending on online or in meetings or just figuring things out. So let's respect the time of uh, those of you that were able to join. And, and there may be other people that, are, that come in and, and join us as we get started here, which, would, which is fine. Um, Basically, uh, at CSU and the Center for Protected Area Management and, and Forest Service International Programs, uh, obviously the two entities that uh, hosted the 2018 uh, Tourism and Protected Area Seminar, 
uh, we wanted to provide this space to be able to check back in with uh, past participants um, from the seminar and see how people are doing, um, especially in light of the fact that uh, we're talking about in the tourism seminar, a very major economic activity in uh, many of the places that uh, you are working and, and a, a big piece of, um, of the budget or economy of, uh, of many of your organizations, institutions, uh, partners and, and local communities that uh, you work with. And um, obviously many of them are struggling to figure out how to, uh, how to reopen, how to adapt, and what the future is going to look like uh, because the future for some time at least is most likely going to be very different than it was uh, when we were spending this beautiful sunny day in the black hills of south dakota uh, just uh, just uh, uh, not too long ago with Spooky the bear um, so um, that's really the essential purpose of this uh, webinar. Um, we are going to be organizing through the center and with the Forest Service a series of additional webinars that are going to be more content focused. Uh, we have a webinar, we will have a couple of webinars coming up focused on um, sustainable tourism in the post COVID world, uh, financial resilience um, thinking in, term, in, in, in dealing with COVID, and then the the role of a park ranger around the world during during COVID times. And so these three webinars will be given both in English and Spanish um, starting in um, June. Um, we don't have the date set yet. We're still working those dates out with the Forest Service, but we'll be sure that we send all of you the links to these webinars once we uh, once we get them scheduled. But therefore, the purpose of this, of this webinar really is just to check in, to hear from each one of you. Um, we wanna hear what's going on in, in Zambia and in, in Ecuador and in, in the Republic of Moldova and, and how you individually and organizationally are adapting to, to the situation. And, and we have a couple of reflection questions that uh, we sent out that we'll put on the screen as well to help us kind of think through uh, and talk about some of the issues that are going on. So um, that's the idea. Um, I, I know we're all probably experts using Zoom by now, but I think Aaron was just gonna share a few uh, tips on, on how to, how to manage, uh, manage our participation. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, um, we don't have a big group, so this won't be too complicated, and I'm sure you guys know this all by now, but we'll ask everyone to keep their microphone on mute when they're not presenting so that we don't have any um, distraction or noise in the background. Um, and when you're talking, you can turn on your video, but just to, to make sure that we're not uh, making it too difficult for some people's internets to stay connected, um, we'll keep video off. And, uh, and since this isn't a big group, you don't have to really worry about raising your hand, but there is an option to raise your hand if you wanna uh, speak at any time. And you could also use the chat box. I think everyone's pretty familiar with this by now. Great, thanks, Aaron. Um, so basically, we just want to do a quick um, round of uh, welcome, giving everybody the opportunity to, um, you know, just let us know how you're doing um, individually. Just a brief synopsis of how things are going, and then we'll we'll get more deeper into the conversation when we get into the reflection questions um, in the second part of the of the program. And so. Um, I'll just start and then we'll just go around. Um, um, things are going pretty well um, over here, um, at least in terms of how we're doing with the center um, and individually. Um, none of our team has gotten sick with coronavirus and uh, we've been able to continue operating and working from home um, without a problem. Um, as Aaron mentioned, uh, just when we were getting started, uh, we've been in self-quarantine and at home uh, now for um, 10 weeks. And so, uh, you know, it's a long time, but uh, we're, uh, we're getting more creative and learning how to, uh, how to adapt to that. But we feel very fortunate that uh, we are able to uh, quarantine at home and, and, and for the time being, uh, you know, keep our jobs and, and keep doing things like this to engage with, uh, with all of you. Um, we have had to cancel um, all of our seminars through the rest of the year. Um, and so that does, uh, 
provide a challenge for us uh, as a, a center that's focused on capacity development and focused on like this picture, bringing people together from around the world to uh, share experiences and knowledge and, and visit places with uh, essentially tourism and face-to-face -face interaction being shut down globally. Um, it puts us in a very uh, big challenge uh, financially uh, as an institution that we're grappling with and trying to figure out uh, what the future uh, will look like um, come early 2021. Um, so I'll leave it there. Uh, that, that's kind of my brief introduction. I'll pass it to Jim uh, for him to give a, a brief intro. Good morning, everyone. Um, well, Ryan's already explained the general situation about the center. Um, it's um, had, I guess, a little bit more impact on me. I'm down to half time the last few months, uh, but also I've been making that up by doing several consultancies. Uh, one regarding helping plan a new national park in the desert in Saudi Arabia. I went there in November and have been continuing to support the project since then. And another helping the international NGO Conservation International with planning a course for coastal rangers in Ecuador. And I went there as well uh, late last year before things shut down. Uh, unfortunately, I've had to cancel a lot of travel, not just our, our seminars, but uh, I was supposed to go to Costa Rica uh, in March. Uh, Ryan and I were both supposed to do a big event, international event on, on concessions in Brazil. Uh, bringing people from around the world in April, and that was canceled. And unfortunately for uh, Olga, uh, she's not online, but I was supposed to go to uh, Russia at the invitation of another ex-graduate of our, of our seminar from last year who works for the U.S. State Department to meet with Russian park managers also uh, in April, and that was canceled. And then Ryan and I and Aaron were all going to go to the Internet to the World Conservation Congress in June in France, and that's been postponed till, till January. So all travel has stopped. Uh, there's some good things out of it. I've lost a lot of weight and I'm in better shape. And uh, aside from that, I've caught more fish in the last four months than I've caught in the last 10 years in Colorado. So that's been wonderful and getting out with my wife. And there the, the lesson is our state parks never closed. Our local parks for the most part never closed. Camping was shut down. Visitor centers were shut down but everything else was kept open so that people could recreate and get out practicing social distancing. So I've been doing that at least a couple times a week and enjoying it and actually getting to a number of state parks that in my 10 years in Colorado, I had never visited. So all in all doing well with my wife, whom you all know, and uh, enjoying life as much as possible and the, the new normal. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, we're, we're very jealous because uh, Jim is getting to quarantine with Damaris and all of us that are getting hungry over here, we want to quarantine with Damaris as well so we can have some of her amazing, <laughs> amazing cooking. So I, I gotta have, we have, you have to tell me later, Jim, what your secret is to be quarantining with all that good food but still losing weight. That's, a, that's impressive. <clears throat> all right, Aaron, let's uh, pass it to you for your intro. <laughs> um, First off, it's so good to see everybody and looking at these photos are bringing it back, back amazing memories. Um, I hope everyone's well, I'm doing well. Um, uh, really grateful to be uh, still working with CPAM and, and even though we don't have our courses this year, we're adapting uh, to uh, still provide trainings uh, for uh for potential participants um as as we go through the situation our women's leadership seminar which we first offered last year uh we're adapting to be online so that's exciting to be able to at least try to uh give that opportunity to women around the world um we haven't we haven't set a date yet but uh that's something we're working on. And we've also been exploring as well, um, some more domestic work, working with a conservation corps in California, which I'm helping lead. Um, and I've just been getting into gardening here, uh, trying to raise some little plants and, and just enjoy where I'm at at the moment. But th things are well, really grateful for the situation. And as far as being healthy, being employed and um, being in a good place. And um, yeah, so it's, it'll be good to hear from you guys. Thanks, Aaron. 
Uh, why don't we go, I'm not sure if Angela is with us. Let's, I know she's on mute right now, but Angela, if you're uh, joined us, if you wanna, there you go, come off mute and, and give us, a, give us a, an update from, from Zambia, from you. Thank you, Ryan, and um, hello, everyone. It's nice to hear your voices, Veronica, uh, Jim, Maureen, Ryan, everyone. It's nice to get back and hear everybody's voices after a long time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing well. Um, I've been working from home for the last, I think, two months. We started off on teleworking, I think, on the 27th of March. Uh, it was a struggle in the beginning, learning to, you know, learn the tricks of working on the PC and whatnot, but I think it's been getting better. Uh, in terms of the situation here in Zambia, as relates to the COVID, uh, we are still seeing uh, an upswing of the cases. Now we are around, I think, 700 cases uh, of people who are infected with the COVID-19. So we're actually on a partial lockdown as a country. Our main national airport is still open, so we still have international flights coming in but uh, the other international airports were closed down. So we are um, on a partial lockdown, but I think in terms of um, how the tourism industry sector has been affected, I think it's because of the restrictions on the travels. So our protected areas are still open, but because of the restrictions on the travels, of course, we have not been seeing many people come to visit. Um, in terms of uh, law enforcement, I think helping out in terms of the law enforcement officers because that is what I do. My job at USAID is about uh, providing support to the government of Zambia for law enforcement and uh, things like that. So that has been going on, but I think we see a situation where we may have um, probably poaching incidences increasing because of what is going on now because the revenue has reduced in terms of uh, tourism because of what's going on now. And that revenue is something that was also helping the communities. And because we've been providing uh, support for the communities to have alternatives and for them to benefit from tourism activities. And because that is now going down, we fear that we may see an upswing in poaching rates uh, in the coming months. So so we are trying to monitor how that is going to unfold during the coming months, but I think it's something that is really of a great concern for us. So for us, actually, this month was supposed to be a time when we they would open off the safari hunting season for Zambia, but because of what has been going on, it's as good as it's closed because there, there, there are no hunters coming in because of the tribal restrictions in their various countries, because most of our our hunters actually come from the US, uh, from South Africa, and these are places where the situation is actually very bad in terms of the COVID. So I think that has actually affected uh, tourism um, uh, industry in terms of the revenue, the projections of the revenue that we expect to get from this industry. So yeah, we are just trying to monitor things uh, and see how things are going to unfold during the coming months. Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's good to try and catch up with everyone else and just to see how we are all doing. I'm fine health-wise, my family is okay. And um, yeah, we are trying to stay safe. My kids have been home, the schools have been closed indefinitely. We don't know when they might be open. So we are all just um, hanging out in the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> So I'll be I'll be leaving at uh, three thirty. I have to join another webinar, so I've uh, allocated thirty minutes for this. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks for joining yeah. us for for the initial part, and and we're glad we we're able to uh, hear from you before you have to go. So thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. And yeah, there's no doubt we can also learn from each other on on tips on how to. Uh, how to entertain the children while we're also trying to work at the same time, all in the same space. <laughs> Definitely been an interesting challenge. Let's go uh, now to uh, Moldova and see if Elena can give us an update from, from her end. Yes, I can. Hello. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Erin. Hello, Jim, Angela, and Veronica. Hopefully, uh, yeah, it was uh, quite. Um, uh, can you hear me? I think there is a message about my audio now we, quality. Yeah. 
Yeah, now we can hear you. The initial now you can hear. Coming, initially it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, nowadays doing quite well in self isolation from. Yes, can you break it up again? Yeah, you, you, you cannot hear me. The previous uh, couple sentences we couldn't. And maybe now, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Um, yeah, we can hear you now. It, it's now it's better. Actually. Okay. Yeah, I've disconnected some of my devices here, so maybe this was the problem. Yeah, so generally, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, so now uh, we are trying to figure out as an organization how to do with the rest of our activities. Uh, since 2018, we had educational projects with the US Forest Service and we were doing very well in terms of interpretation of our nature heritage. So it was very good experience in the US that I tried to, uh, to put into value in our projects here, educational ones. But as well as in the other countries because of the whole um, or even maybe for the next year. Uh, and the rest, uh, staying home and as Erin uh, is doing, I'm also doing gardening, cooking. Uh, currently, this is a very nice activity. So, yeah, combining the two. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thanks, Elena. Yeah, and unfortunately, we, we missed part of what you were saying, but uh, uh, when we continue the conversation, hopefully we'll be able to hear some more from you about uh, some of the specifics. Um, let's now, uh, just wanted to recognize that we have Thea also with us, and we'll get to her here in just a second. Uh, so great, Thea. Glad, glad you could join <laughs> us to, to hear from you. I'm so happy just to say hi. I really yeah. joined shortly. I have some deadlines, sorry, couldn't stay for a long time, but I'm really happy to see in the list Ryan, hi, Erin, oh. Angie, Lenachka, Privet, Jim, hi, <laughs> <laughs> and Veronica, I see in the list. So, Thea, why don't you go ahead, since we have you up now, why don't, we're every, just going around and everybody's just providing us with an update on how they're doing and, and, and what's going on. Uh, just a brief overview, and then we'll, we'll, as time goes on, we'll get into some more uh, detailed yeah. questions that we have. But uh, we'd love to hear from you how things are in Georgia. Mm, yeah, I'm doing, um, as most of the um, <laughs> communities and people are doing in the world, uh, due to COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I'm doing um, home office, office for uh, more than two months now, mm -hmm. sitting at home and working uh, intensively. We didn't stop working for our protected areas in Georgia uh, and Armenia. In general, the situation in Georgia related to COVID-19 is quite promising as uh, World Health Organization said uh, Georgia is a small country with uh, people about 4 million. We have just 700 cases uh, of which uh, uh, 450 already recovered. Uh, unfortunately we have 12 deaths but Georgia still stays in kind of green zone. So welcome to Georgia people. This summer, autumn. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm doing well, uh, continue working with the Caucasus Nature Fund uh, as a country director, kind of new status I have since uh, 
I was in United States. I'm still responsible for activities ongoing here in Georgia. Uh, and very busy, so uh, doing home office is not really uh, joyful, I would say, because uh, um, time management is really difficult. So uh, wake up, starting working, uh, and endless uh, working. Uh, sometimes we, for we forget there are holidays, there are weekends. In very limited times go out for walking and just to, to grab some uh, food and uh, pharmacies. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very briefly. How are you doing? <laughs> Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Thea, for that, uh, for that update. Um, really appreciate it. Um, let's now, let's go to Veronica and, and get the update from uh, Ecuador and from, from Galapagos, and then uh, we'll go from there. So, Veronica. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Galapagos. Here is 7 a.m. I'm glad to hear you all of you. Well, I'll already uh, speak about, a little bit about it, but yeah, we are the last week, the last two weeks, we are working like crazy. <laughs> Even uh, we are uh, uh, doing home office, but still with a Zoom, lots of meetings because uh, we really need to reinvent the tourism. Uh, you know, the isolation in Galapagos is difficult and probably 90% of the activities uh, depends on tourism. So it's uh, really hard for Galapagos, for the local community, for the tour operators, for everyone. So. Um, we are uh, doing some plans, uh, protocols uh, about how can uh, reopen the the park and the operations, um, because the only way to to come here is by plane, and we all know, know about this uh, uh, the uh, about the the emergency, how difficult it is to to travel by by plane. And also a big uh, part of knowing Galapagos is on board on a ship and a cruise ship. Even our ships are uh, the, the biggest is for 100 people. But anyway, there's uh, lots of crew members of the big ships uh, with COVID. Uh, fortunately for Galapagos, we only have few cases and very controlled. Um, but the situation on board yeah, uh, we have uh, lots of people like with COVID, but now the, the situation is, is under control. Um, also, uh, for us was a huge opportunity because it was the first time since the, since the National Park uh, start or was um, founded that we don't have tourism. So for us, in some, in some ways, it's the, like a historical situation, especially for the environment. So uh, we start uh, monitoring. Um, we are collecting some, uh, some data. Uh, actually, uh, yesterday at night, depart a, sh a ship to some visitor places. Uh, of, of course, we, we follow all the um, biosecurity measures for the people we, we we had like four people a park rangers to go to the uh, some isolated really isolated islands uh, that are visitor sites to collect data so uh, we hope to to have some results in um, probably august so i let you know when i have some of the results um, in in my case, as individual, my family, it's okay. Uh, my mother is in, is in Quito, which is the capital of Ecuador. And I am in, in Galapagos, but I am really lucky because I live inside the National Park headquarters. So I, I am able to, to walk around. Uh, uh, at least I am not so, so close in my place, so, so confined in my place. Great, thanks, Veronica, for that update. Uh, we know that the situation in Galapagos is very serious, with uh, almost complete dependency on on tourism activities that are closed down. So, 
we can we can talk some more about that in just a little bit. But I also noticed that Carolina has joined us from Peru. So let's see if Carolina can come off of mute and uh, give us an update on how things are going with her life and and things how things are in Peru. Hi everyone, nice to see you. <laughs> um, we've been now in strict lockdown for two months here in Peru. Uh, it's crazy. Um, they're starting to liberate some activities little by little, but still, like I've been haven't been out of the house barely the last two months. But fortunately, I I'm part of the lucky the lucky ones that have a comfortable home. I can work from home. I can still get my paycheck at the end of the month. But the situation is not like this for the whole population, of course. It's really, really difficult because we have a lot of informal um, people like work people that work informally. They try to get some uh, support from the government for the people that are more poor, but also these people don't have uh, banks and uh, they couldn't get the, the money. So there were a lot of uh, people going to the banks to take this money and it was like the numbers have risen so so fast the last weeks. It's crazy, it's very, very difficult the situation. But um, as I said, I'm part of the lucky ones that can still work. We are still working a lot from home and trying to see how we can um, like develop more content. Uh, we cannot travel, we cannot go to the conservation areas, but we can still support them from, from, from home. Uh, on tourism, tourism is one of the most affected sectors, I think, as, if, as in every country. Uh, and we are working now in, in a new edition of a, of a tourism guide to conservation areas in Peru, uh, which is really nice. We will try to have it in September, so when tourism reactivates, it's a possibility to promote tourism in Peru because tourism abroad is going to be really hard. So I'm working really, really like full time on that. The, the new guide is really, really nice. I'll send, you, send it to you guys at least um, digitally when it's ready. Um, it has all the privately protected areas in Peru and some other conservation initiatives. And the idea is to promote this kind of different uh, tourism to all the people that want to. And here is baby Kai. You guys want to meet him? <laughs> of course, of course. Say hi. So baby Kai turned one year old in quarantine. Oh my God. Hola. And now he's running all over around the house. Wow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> That's the most important news, actually. Yes. Baby. Maybe Kai will see you in 20 years in the tourism seminar. Yeah, we actually like um, <laughs> have traveled a lot with Kai. Like we we got him out of um, Lima into the rainforest when he was one month in my backpack. <laughs> and yeah, we've been lucky to travel a lot the last year together. And now. We cannot travel, but he can at least go to the park. We have now the possibility for since last week that little kids can go and play for half an hour um, close to the house. So he's getting out some of that energy he has. <laughs> and he got that from his mom. So yeah, for me personally, everything is good. I'm working full time for from my house, but things are difficult in Peru. And as Vero said, we are trying to reinvent everything. And yeah, also like Vero said, there's a small bright side for nature as well, uh, that places are with no pressure. Uh, natural places are showing so much biodiversity and so much like resilience. It's crazy. In, we also work a lot in, in the fisheries sector and the oceans are recovering so fast that you can see the the resilience that nature has and maybe it's also an opportunity to to yeah put some less pressure on it for a little bit 
and but we also will have to reinvent how to to make all yeah to 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 reactivate the tourism sector but as i said we're working hard on that and the idea is to promote uh, things locally first and promote tourism in protected areas in peru so it's a, a big opportunity as well nice to see you great thanks uh carolina for that update on your end um uh, yeah, as, as Jim had mentioned earlier, for some of you that uh, weren't connected or whatever, the the uh, you know one of the things that uh, we've been thinking a lot about here with uh, CPAM is just the uh, the importance of uh, of local protected areas, not just uh, you know the big uh, national protected areas that might be far away from um, where people live, but uh, we have been fortunate in in Colorado at least that. We've been able to maintain open uh, our, our city protected areas, our county protected areas, and our state protected areas. And so even though we're dealing with a very serious uh, COVID situation here in the United States uh, and in Colorado, um, I think uh, we're over 1.5 million cases now of COVID in, in the US with over 90,000 deaths. So it's very serious. Um, even just here in the state of Colorado, we have 22,000 cases and almost uh, over 1,200 1, deaths. So a very obviously a very ser serious situation, but and at, yet at the same time, people have been able to um, still access their parks for mental health uh, and uh, obviously uh, needing to still have uh, uh, very uh, strict social distancing and going out with a mask on, in, in, on the public trails. But uh, I think that's helped people uh, deal with the situation in, in a way that, well, for us, with the numbers still going up, even though we're 10 weeks into the very serious period here in the U.S., um, those of us that, like Carolina says, are fortunate enough to be able to keep home uh, teleworking will probably be doing this for many, many more months, uh, unfortunately. Um, you know, that's all. I think that's the struggle that many of our countries are facing: is the the interest and the need for those people that that have that are without work to get the economy restarted, so that those individuals can have can get back to their livelihoods and start providing for their families, because the situation is very serious for many people. But the balance of how do you do that while at the same time uh, trying to uh, prevent. Um, something like hap like has happened in the U in the United States, uh, happening in other parts of the world, and uh, we're still seeing the number of cases going up. So, um, well, we we we'd love to uh, dive deeper. Uh, we appreciate the update from from everyone, and um, as as uh, uh, you know, as we go forward here and and try to envision what uh, our all of our individual lives and our our work lives are going to be looking like. Uh, through 2020 and into 2021, um, you know, we, we are spending a lot of time here thinking about uh, how to build better resilience structures for our own organization and, and trying to think creatively about how, how can we engage in the kinds of ca capacity development activities that we like to engage in for this next generation. You know, this, this, we're looking at this next generation here. Uh, we need to build a better world for the little ones. And so, um, we're, we're just curious uh, about you all and what, what, what creative opportunities do you see coming, coming up? I mean, how, how, how are you envisioning working over the next six months, eight months, one year? You know, we're wondering, will we have the tourism seminar even next year in 2021? We're hoping we'll be back and being able to do some of those activities. But, you know, what, what will that world look like? Will people be willing to get on a plane and travel around the world? Do people want to come to the United States with such high levels of uh, coronavirus, you know? And, uh, and then what, you know, you all experience the, the tight conditions in the vans traveling across and everything. It's, you know, we, we have to think very differently about the kinds of activities that we're going to be able to do for some time to come, at least until there's a vaccine, until we have the, this coronavirus under control, if they're able to find a vaccine. And so we're curious to hear from you all. What, um, if anyone has... Um, um, some updates on on how you're thinking creatively, how you're thinking in terms of how to make your organizations more resilient, um, or how the protected areas in your countries are thinking about this. Um, if anybody would like to uh, to chime in, we'd love to hear from you. 
Uh, hi, again. <laughs> it's me again. <laughs> yeah, something we've been uh, talking about uh, with some lodges that uh, operate in, in protected areas or in different parts of Peru is they're already working on this like COVID pack, you know, and when tourism start to activate at least locally, the idea is to offer, offer these packages that have all the, um, the hygiene and health um, regulations, but also that offer you like this social distance, like guaranteed, you know, and that you can separate, like you are gonna be sure that um, all this, this, the safety and health uh, um, regulations are taking place. And they are already working on these packs, trying to sell this opportunity you know to go for even one week or two weeks actually to have social distance by being on a on a on a lodge or a, or some protected area uh, it's hard because normally this means like you have to operate a, a lower capacity not hundred percent um, but it's trying to make a balance I think um, on the income and the um, on yeah what you can offer but this is one thing we're working on and in, in our organization as Ryan said we are thinking of this uh, working remotely for a long term and I think for us this is really good uh, because we can do this work remotely especially all the uh, yeah the office work not not of course the travel but I think it's an opportunity to to engage more people because it's easy for people for example in digital events anyone can join you don't have to to have any um not so much effort to transport somewhere or to to just you have to connect and for engaging more people in in conservation activities sometimes it's even easier uh, with these digital opportunities so yeah, these are two things we're working on, and I think it's, it's there are some opportunities also now. Um, yep. <laughs> Great. In, anyone else, Elena? Yes, I can also share some some ideas from my country, from my organization. So taking into can you hear me? You're breaking up. Mm. Keep on I trying. couldn't hear Len. I can. Uh, if no, we, it's better. If it continues to break up, you might want to type it in the chat so we can at least read it in the least. But let's try. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. It's better. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try. So, um, uh, briefly then, um, for us, uh, I think this uh, very dramatic situation with the COVID um, is an opportunity to do the necessity to build the infrastructure for tourism in nature protected areas. Because so far tourism was more um, in the situation where it is possible for the moment, and I think the entire 2020 uh, will not be. Uh, for us. Um, the possibility to promote the inbound tourism, the locals who would travel around the country. But for this, we need infrastructure, what we don't have at the moment. There are just a few protected areas where people can go on a path, uh, have a trail, uh, including the ones we've uh, designed within our projects, uh, with our organization. So for our organization, the opportunity now that COVID-19 uh, creates actually is uh, to, uh, to do lobby for our 
um, for the nature uh, tourism and for the um, authorities to build the necessary infrastructure. In the entire 2020, we will be working uh, with the authorities only um, on a project to the, um, to the capitalization of the protected uh, areas uh, potential. So I think for us, this is a good opportunity to use uh, in order to create the, the uh, possibilities and the um, uh, conditions for tourists to travel in the country the next years. Briefly, this would be mm -hmm. one of the opportunities that this situation brings to our Thank you, Elena. I hope you've heard at least we some heard of my 70 per 70 percent 70 percent i i'll type also here in the chat just to have it as a note uh, veronica what, what are you guys starting to think about in galapagos i know you mentioned you're starting to think about these protocols and different approaches to get galapagos back open what what, what are some of the initial conversations you're having well, uh, the, all the, the big tour operators start to work in about three or four weeks ago, uh, building these protocols. There's, there's one for restaurants, one for um, ships, for hotels, for everything. Uh, also for airports. So uh, trying to decide if every tourist that comes into the Galapagos should come with a, uh, could come with a COVID, COVID, COVID? Um, test and uh, also uh, try to 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 put some lines uh, to or uh, determine some lines to visit the places. Uh, we always said you should uh, uh, bring always your mask and everywhere are full of uh, alcohol and um, uh, chloro. Chloro is that right? So uh, these things. Also, there's many things that people said about uh, uh, not paying the nat national parks pre-entrance, but we are not uh, agree with this. So uh, I think won't be a measure. Uh, but also, like this weekend, there's like some humanitarian law that the assembly approved, and there they put something related with the. Uh, with the international flights and open um, skies on the Galapagos. But we are against this thing. We hopefully the government uh, about this measure because we consider it is not good for the Galapagos. One of our biggest uh, problem in Galapagos is the alien species. So it uh, could be really dangerous for Galapagos, but also for the economy of the entire country, because most of our tourism is based on the promotion of the Ecuador. Um, so we'll see what happens. It's really, really, really bad times. Um, we we don't know what what we do. For example, we had a meeting with some. We had some people that comes in a, their own ships, private ships. Uh, uh, like very rich people that wants to come so to some like a destiny um, very special and uh, very nature so uh, there are some tour operators that ask you to open like for this kind of uh, uh, I don't know the, the the tours yeah that most the people comes into their own um, planes and then it goes into their own ships. And for the for the national park, it's good because they pay a lot. <laughs> but in, for the people in general, it's not so so good. It's not profitable. So we need to try to find something that uh, helps most of the people that lives from the tourism. Uh, also, we have lots of uh, immigrants from the mainland, so the people start uh, going to see their families because they don't have any incomes. 
So it's, it's, it's difficult, but let's see. Uh, also, we are working in, a, uh, in the plans. We will open probably, or we are talking about open on the 1st of July, uh, because all the tour operators say that if you keep uh, close, it keeps the, the, the lock down, uh, we are not able to sell. So what they want is uh, we can give uh, a date so they can start uh, selling from this date. Right, so again, that idea of having to balance um, local economy and, and local needs with, uh, you know, just m making sure to try to provide as much time for that curve to come down. Um, so, yeah, well, that's, it that sounds like you have some good initial ideas. Um, um, uh, I don't know, Taya, did, did, did you want to provide any additional thoughts on, on, on how uh, you are handling things with the, the Caucus Foundation? Any new innovative ideas that you guys are working on? Thank you, Ryan. Yes, um, well, COVID really affected protected area system of Georgia. Uh, last year, we had uh, uh, 8 million visitors for country and uh, 1 million was uh, uh, in uh, protected areas. However, uh, this year, uh, no visitors almost, uh, which means that uh, revenues which system expected will not be collected. Uh, that's why government requested from uh, Caucasus Nature Fund um, emergency grant. We are working right now on emergency grant, so which uh, will replace um, and take over um, some uh, operational uh, expenses uh, from the state. Uh, it's about uh, uh, 1.25 million euro. Uh, to replace government's budgets uh, um, and we still continue working on the park level. We have 11 parks uh, where uh, we contribute directly. So in addition to 1.25 million euro, we will be giving about uh, 700,000 euro to 11 parks to cover their operational needs. Uh, and uh, we also have technical assistance um, uh, program, uh, which is funded uh, from a uh, global environment facility uh, through UNDP. Uh, in total, our financial support to protected area system will be uh, about 1.95 million euro in total. Uh, however, we also have concerns because um, uh, six or seven months is left, so it's time constrained if they are eligible to spend everything they requested. This is one big question. Uh, on the other hand, we are thinking about uh, crisis management in the long term. So this emergency grant is uh, one-time support what uh, our government and protected area system is planning to do uh next year's uh, because uh, these years uh, there will be less visitors less revenues generated which means that next year budget will also suffer right uh, we are trying to uh, propose uh, alternative uh, income sources uh, uh, which is, uh, for example, entrance fees are not collected uh, for entering to our parks. Uh, we are lobbying and trying to push uh, government uh, to apply starting from this year. Uh, because uh, starting from June 15th, uh, um, um, domestic tourism uh, will be opened and starting from July 1st, international flights will be allowed. We expect some visitors. However, of course, number will be much less than the previous years. Um, this is very briefly, but um, uh, from alternative and opportunities uh, uh, cases, we also try to diversify our partners pool, let's say. 
Last year, we uh, did announcement for small grants uh, for protected area friends associations. Uh, we have four winners, um, but uh, uh, we also discovered that uh, there is a big potential for protected areas, friends associations as an independent NGOs working closely with uh, individual parks to do, uh, to attract uh, uh, alternative sources of funding and to implement alternative projects in benefit to, to protected areas. Um, uh, but still a lot to do. Some uh, projects uh, will fail definitely because they uh, had deadlines and they required direct uh, communication with uh, partners and stakeholders. So, so some of them are uh, still on hold. However, um, we hope for the best. <laughs> and. Uh, I will update you end of the year or beginning of next year. <laughs> yeah, well, we wish you lots of luck. Hopefully things will, will turn up and start to get better for, for everybody. Um, may, you know, may, I could share a couple of thoughts of uh, different things going on around here that, that might be of interest. And then I might ask for Jim or, or Aaron to also uh, chime in. Um, what, you know, so I mentioned all of our local protected areas maintaining uh, open status dur during the, the lockdown. Um, many of our big regional uh, national parks that we, that we visited, like Yellowstone and Grand Teton and Rocky Mountain National Park have, have all been closed. Um, we are actually, though, seeing that uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, for example, is about to open here just in about uh, le less than two weeks from now. And um, it's interesting to look at kind of what they're thinking about as they start to open. And, and one of the things that uh, uh, they're talking about is doing a, uh, uh, an advanced reservation for your ticket to be able to go into the park. So basically, they, they don't want to have the situation um, where you have just lines of cars all coming into the park at the same time. And then those groups of people... Um, you know, hitting the trail entrance all at the same time. And so they're looking at maybe like an advanced reservation system where what you'd have to do is um, uh, basically uh, in advance, go in, log in, uh, select a date and a time that they have availability where you can make a reservation, just almost like you'd make a reservation for a hotel or for, for a restaurant. Uh, for a specific date and a specific time. And then they would do timed entry and allow uh, people to come in, but probably looking at a reduction of about 60% of what the normal uh, visitor loads would be in a given day at the park, just to help reduce the, um, the potential crowding that could take place, especially at trailheads, at the beginning of trails, um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, probably a lot of the visitor centers and um, interpretation presentations and those kind of things will probably remain closed for some time, which is obviously creating uh, a problem, especially for a lot of our young uh, conservation people, um, university students, um, entry level positions, as well as our some retirees that uh, go and work in the parks in these positions. Um, you know, many of these these seasonal jobs are are not going to be offered in many in many different instances this year. So, um, we're also obviously the you know maintaining kind of social distancing, yeah, in trying to enforce the use of masks, which is 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 interesting. It's been a very challenging here in the U.S. Maybe different in many other countries, but when people go out and go hiking, and go running, and go biking, and do all these outdoor activities. Uh, there's a lot of people here in the U.S. that just don't want to wear a mask when they're doing outdoor recreation, which, I mean, obviously we're there to breathe in the air. And, and, uh, and, and so it's, uh, you know, that it has been met with some challenges by some, some people. Um, I think Rocky, uh, as well as other areas here, like many of you have indicated, um, are also very much looking at the possibility of as we start to open back, back up, much of the visitation, recreation, and tourism will be probably more local. Uh, instead of having as much international uh, visitation coming from all over the world to some of these areas, or from even neighboring countries or states, 
a lot of uh, the reopening might be focused a bit more on um, local visitation uh, or, or, or nearby uh, regional visitation to, to these areas, at least at the beginning. Um, one of the things that I thought was also very interesting with uh, people um, having their children at home, uh, doing homeschooling, and uh, you know the teachers uh, struggling to provide kind of interactive opportunities for kids that are learning at home, at least in areas where there is internet access. Um, uh, California state parks created a really interesting program where they have now created virtual field trips to all of their state parks in California that they offer through an online platform. And so teachers can uh, assign their students who are, who are doing their schooling from home to attend uh, a, a virtual field trip to a state park and then uh, engage in some post virtual field trip um, uh, activities like questions or writing up a summary of their visit. Uh, talking about what they've seen. And so obviously it's not the same as uh, getting out into nature, which is ultimately what we want to do with, uh, with the young, with the next generation. But um, in the meantime, it provides an opportunity for access in a different way uh, that also still helps keep kids engaged. And um, you've seen many, many people um, taking this approach and, and for, for areas that are still looking to develop a culture of visitation to national parks, um, this could really be an opportunity because many people are at home. Um, if they have internet access and, and aren't able to go out, they're probably looking desperate for something to do. And so there may be ways that we can use this opportunity to try and uh, use the protected areas through virtual visits to, to get them at least hooked uh, from home. And then maybe once things open back up, um, we'll have a greater uh, group of our citizens that are wanting to visit their their own their own protected areas so um, those are just a few ideas of uh, what we're hearing from some of our partners and colleagues here um, I'd like to ask Jim uh, to uh, give us some of his own reflections uh, on, on what he's been uh, hearing and, and, and seeing uh, thanks Ryan uh... One of the first things I hopefully will get up on our Facebook uh, page with the help of Aaron in the next couple of days is the taped webinar I participated in last Friday with the uh, IUCN uh, Tourism and Protected Areas Group together with Dr. Paul Eagles of Canada. Uh, he was very critical of the severe restrictions on visitation even to urban parks imposed by the Canadian federal and provincial governments and one of his arguments was that there's very little confirmation of outdoor spread of COVID. Uh, there was a study done of thousands of people in Wuhan, China, the original uh, epicenter of the outbreak, showing they could only find one person who had been contaminated uh, by someone else out of doors. And there's more and more studies showing that uh, 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 sunlight and uh, air circulation and being outdoors is not nearly as dangerous as being any place uh, inside a building. And so to justify uh, a slow reopening of, uh, of public parks. Uh, I, uh, in that webinar, I shared some tips on of coping financially. And I'll just mention to you what I'm hearing and watching a lot of webinars and all the web traffic is uh, looking possibly at it. The, the first is that um, there's going to be a surge in visitation. There's pent up demand locally, nationally, internationally. And that is going to happen, and we have to gear up for it, and we have to use the best sanitary information available and be using this time to preparing our staff, preparing our facilities uh, for that and following the sanitary guidelines of health ministries and other health officials in our countries. But the things I would like to point out that are positives is that we have the highest unemployment in the United States right now in 80 years. That's the case in many countries around the world, particularly tourism-dependent communities like gateway towns. And so there's going to be a lot of government programs funded by your own governments, by international donors, if you're in a developing country, for employment generation. So it's going to be very important to have what we call in the United States shovel-ready projects that you can roll out to potential funders, your own government or other governments, to basically put people back to work doing things we needed to get done anyway, such as trail maintenance, putting in new signs, uh, doing all of the deferred maintenance in our areas. 
Uh, so that's one thing, have ideas ready for projects that can be funded because there's going to be in many countries new employment generation programs, sort of like Conservation Corps. We have several bills in our Congress to bo bo bolster our Conservation Corps programs. The second thing is that it's a, it's a valuable lesson the places that depend heavily on tourism for paying your, your bills. If you have a protected area that has been highly dependent on tourism revenues to think about doing two things. Number one is diversifying within tourism, and the second is diversifying away from tourism. To have things like a Caucasus Fund, uh, different types of uh, uh, permanent funding mechanisms uh, so that you don't become overly dependent on only one source, which as we've seen with this outbreak, can disappear in just a short period of time. And the last thing, I, two other things I'd like to mention. One is that there's a lot more emphasis on public health with going outdoors. And so read up on it, study up on it, look for, look for alliances with health authorities because there's a lot more emphasis on the role of parks, not just in physical education and in physical health, but also in mental health after people have been cooped up uh, so long. And then finally, and another good thing that's coming out of this is a new global push to further restrict uh, wildlife commerce and trade. Um, uh, there are a lot of groups that are against it. Uh, just a flat prohibition because many communities depend on marketing wildlife-based artisanry, for example. But there's no doubt that there's going to be a, a renewed push for stopping global trade in, in live animals, for example, that can be, be uh, disease vectors. So just a few thoughts to share with you all on uh, what we can expect and trying to keep upbeat and optimistic about new opportunities that will arise in the future. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks also, Elena, for uh, adding um, uh, some more detailed information about what's going on uh, in Moldova uh, into the chat so that we have an opportunity to, to, uh, to read that. Um, um, Aaron, did, uh, did you want to add anything um, to the conversation here about things that you've been thinking about or participating in with, um, with uh, different webinars and whatnot? Um. I think you guys are pretty complete. Um, I've been on webinars about health and I think that's, that's an interesting thing and definitely um, we're realizing that more and more that, that you know, nature is important for our health, especially when we are confined to our homes. I just um, took the opportunity to um, go on a hike this past weekend in Wyoming, just an hour away. Um, and it was interesting to, witness uh, visitor behavior. Um, and, and I think it's important as we, as, even though there's low transmission within, within outside, while we're outside, um, just, just thinking about how to best promote good and responsible um, visitor behavior, because I, I've noticed that visitor behavior is just kind of, at least in our area, kind of all over the board, but I think that's something important to consider and look for what the best recommendations are for any um, area that has visitation and is thinking of opening up, which sounds like everyone is doing. And that's all. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, the uh, as we start to get back open, and um, we, you know, we uh, um, the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in the eastern United States opened up just about a week ago or so, and um, uh, there were some serious issues there with visitation because so many people. It's uh, the Great Smoky Mountains is our biggest, uh, highest visited national park here in the United States, with I think around nine million visitors per year. And uh, it's, it's so close to so many large population centers in the Eastern United States that once they reopened and people were, were feeling that need to be out in nature uh, after being uh, confined to their homes that uh, once they opened, there was just a massive uh, arrival of visitors from all over the East Coast uh, from, I think they said it was something like 19 different states or something like that had arrived to the Great Smoky Mountains. And so uh, there was just challenges because there was too many people and, and, and social distancing was almost impossible. And then you had this mix of behaviors like Aaron's talking about where some people have masks and some people don't have masks and some people are really considerate about the space that they provide between people. Some people are not. And so uh, just when you have that checkerboard pattern of uh, activity and, and um, uh, behavior that it makes it really difficult for managers to, to, to 
to control uh, that activity. And you know, I think one of the one of the big challenges, at least that we're facing here in the U.S., and I'm sure other other countries will be dealing with the same, is that you know, if you accidentally open up too quickly and get back to some new normal too quickly, and then you have a spike in cases. You know, thinking about what the country's going to have to do. Will we go back into lockdown again? I mean, there's nothing that's going to be worse for 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 our local economies than just starting to get back and going again, and then have to go back on lockdown for two to three more months. Um, and so, it's going to be really important to try and get this right. And the problem is, is that nobody really knows what right is. And so, at least in one sense, we're all dealing with this uncertainty together. Hopefully we can continue to provide opportunities uh, like these kind of gatherings, like the different webinars that so many different organizations are offering up for us to be able to uh, exchange information and ideas. Um, I see uh, Jim uh, has uh, thankfully uh, uh, posted to the chat um, some of the uh, guidelines that are coming out for parks and recreation agencies on how to start considering reopening. Um, there's lots of information that's uh, starting to come out like that. So uh, keep that in mind as well. And uh, yeah, we're, you know, keep, keep reaching out to us and letting us know any new ideas and thoughts that you guys have, because we're happy to keep uh, uh, sharing them with all of our different networks and, and uh, past groups of participants, because um, everybody is definitely interested in knowing more about, uh, about how, how to do this safely. Um, Bef uh, you know, we we can we can stay on here for for a few more minutes uh, before we uh, wrap up. I I just I'd love to see if anybody has anything else that we really haven't had a chance to talk about that you'd like to uh, you'd like to share with the group. So I'll just pause for a second and see uh, if uh, if anybody else would like to chime in. Well, we really appreciate you uh, taking the time, making the time to join us for this conversation. Um, uh, one of the most important parts of our Center for Protected Area Management at CSU is our network of people like all of you. Um, you know, we, we do what we do because we love, uh, we love interacting with uh, people from around the world, learning from all the unique ways that you guys are approaching conservation and, and tourism and protected areas. Um, that's why we hold the events that we do and, and uh, we're trying to find ways like through Zoom meetings and uh, the different webinars. Um, for some of you that weren't on in the very beginning, um, I'd mentioned that we have a number of webinars that we're gonna be hosting together with the Forest Service uh, coming up in June and July. Uh, we're going to be filling in the time when we normally would be running our seminar programs over the over the the summer months here in the, in the northern hemisphere to um, to uh, to host a series of additional events. Um, our webinars will be much more focused on content, and so we'll have a series of uh, of speakers and panelists, and we'll open it up to questions from the audience. And so we're expecting those will be open to a much broader audience. But we will definitely make sure you all get the invitation uh, to participate in those events as well. And um, yeah, feel feel free to reach out to us if you have questions, if, if there's additional resources we can pass your way, if you have good ideas that we can post to our communities through our Facebook page, we'd love to hear from you on those as well. And uh, more than anything, we'd just like to wish you all the best, um, patience, um, uh, you know, uh, resilience as you start to think about what the next six months, the next 12 months has. Uh, in store for both you individually, for your families, but also for your, your institutions and your protected area systems, for the local communities that you all serve. Um, it's very difficult times, obviously, all around the world. And um, the only way we're gonna get through this is by, by coming together as a global community and sharing um, all of the information and the, and the, the experiences that we're, that we're testing out to see what works and what doesn't work. So hopefully we can kind of continue to maintain that spirit here through these kinds of gatherings. And um, we look forward to staying in touch. So thank you all again for joining us. It was so wonderful to see all your faces, hear your voices. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to staying in touch. So um, take care, keep in touch.
and we'll hope to see you all soon. Everybody, take all right. We'll see you next year, or at least um, my country representatives uh, will come to join next year force. Yes, I hope so. I hope so too. Exactly. We 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 have a good start with now with you and with with Georgie and Nino. So we'll keep them coming. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. I really yeah. enjoyed seeing you listening. By the way, I had a chance to have Hong Kong co conversation with Olga. She has problem with internet connection, so she's yeah. sending greetings. She's fine. Okay. okay. Well, and, and you know, there, there's one debate we were having that we haven't really fig figured out the debate. So I'd like to encourage you, Thea and, and Elena, you know, feel free to send me some Georgia wine and Moldova wine so I can have some taste <laughs> tests here at home during home quarantine to see which one is the better wine, Georgia or Moldova. We have to figure this out. <laughs> Last year it was delivered, I remember. It was, it was delicious. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Thank you guys. Stay healthy. Stay, stay healthy. Stay safe, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.